morning. I want to invite you to Sunday school every Sunday morning, 9.15. Uh, come be with us. Uh, prayer walkers are meeting each Sunday morning at 8.30. And then uh, online, we have prayer time with Pastor Mark and Carrie Hook Ministries Thursday at 7. Both are going to be on Facebook live stream. Uh, we have praise team practice Monday at 7. And uh, also, thank you to Charles Miller uh, for putting on the CPR class. Um, there was a lot of people that had hands in that to make that go on. Thank you for, for that group of people. And, um, also, the, the conference we had was a great time. We had, I think, 19 and 20 uh, both days. It was really, really, really good. Um, also, next Sunday is the last day to make your reservation for the Passover dinner. It's going to be Wednesday, April 5th at 630. Uh, cost is 10 for adults and 5 for kids. If you want to be at a park, definitely sign up for that. Uh, we need candy for the egg hunt. Um, so if you can, bring some. Uh, put it in the foyer over here. Uh, also, we have a drop-in bridal shower for Hannah Mayhew. Uh, it's coming up this Saturday from 2 to 4. They're registered at Target, Amazon, Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, please stop by. Um, local board is going to be meeting next right. Sunday after the AM worship. And then Resurrection Sunday, Easter, April 9th. Uh, we're going to have the breakfast at 9 a.m. You don't want to miss that. Uh, we have the worship at 10, and then we have the egg hunt for the kids, kids following morning worship. Uh, we have three different tithing opportunities for you. We have the boxes by the doors. You could mail it in, or if you want, you can download the Giveify app. And uh, Mark has some more information for you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. Glad to see you here at church. It's not raining today like it was raining yesterday when we were down here at the retreat. Sound like the roof was going to uh, come off the building a time or two. But anyway, I just want to mention one more time. This will probably be the last time, right, Pastor? You may have to do this for the rest of your life. Oh, <laughs> we're going to do it good in one time today, and then we won't have to do it again. Everybody be knows really it's, been, good. it's been a little over, what, 20 years since we moved into this building? And last fall, we noticed that we were having some real issues with our guttering. Uh, not the downspouts, but the gutter itself. Uh, we started looking and noticed that we had rusted out spots in it. And as a board and trustees, we took it upon ourselves to get in touch with the original builder. And uh, for probably four months there, we fought a battle that we figured might help us out. We might get some relief from the cost of replacing the guttering. But uh, unfortunately, I think uh, we caught it a little too late. So... We explored our options. We had uh, several folks come down and look at the building. And nobody really wanted to get committed to putting up new gutters. And we finally decided that, you know what, this is a project that uh, I think we can do as a church. And uh, God led us to the place that makes the guttering. Initially, for Myrick Construction or anybody else to come down and put the new guttering up, $40,000. That was the estimate. And we're like, you know, that's a tenth of the cost of the building. Back when we built it, that cannot be right. So we've got a company in Granite Quarry that makes the metal, makes the guttering, does everything. We have already ordered it. We've got uh, some very talented people in the church, me not being one of them, who uh, says, hey, we got scaffolding and, you know, uh, the Hortons over here. I I'm like, man, I am so glad you're, you're giving me advice on what we need to do with this gutter. I'm just going to turn it over to you. So, uh, but no, uh, 
Keith and Brantley, they've got some good ideas on how we need to do this. Here's the catch. We're going back with aluminum guttering, so we'll never have this problem again, at least in my lifetime. Uh, and the cost for the material is right under $10,000. We think this is a project that we got a group of men in the church that, you know, we're not going to come down here and work on it all week to get it knocked out, but maybe on the weekend or a day off, come down and gradually start putting up the new guttering. Now, here's the catch, and it's not a catch, really. If you would like to participate, and you don't want to get on the roof, <laughs> you don't want to put gutters up, you can participate by purchasing a section of gutter. And this section seems like it's quite a bit of money, and it is. 20-foot section is th rough, roughly $300. 10-foot section, $150. They're 20, they come in 20-foot sections. That's why I'm mentioning this. So if you don't want to buy a 20-foot section and would like to donate to buy 10-foot of that 20-foot, it's going to cost you 150 bucks. Uh, if you want to buy one foot, hey, that's great. We'll take one foot, that's $15. But if you would like to make a donation for the gutter replacement, please see Teresa, Pastor Mark, or myself. And uh, we just want to get this thing knocked out as quick as we can and thought this would be a good way for you know the whole congregation to participate especially those that don't want to get up on a ladder or up on the roof. So that's all I've got to say, and I thank you very much. You think he should be off for the rest of his life for that, or you think, yeah. okay, good job. Connie said, yeah, I heard that. Um, one, uh, one other thing about that, and Mark's been very humble. He did most of the shoe leather work on this to figure out, to find who could do this, so we really appreciate all Mark has done. Listen, um, we are able to pay for the order, uh, but uh, it would help us immensely if you can contribute to it. The, uh, I say this because we have a lot to be excited about in our church, and I think too many times we get bogged down with so many things. Listen, um, Lord willing, in two years, we should have this building pay, paid off, okay? Yeah. And so this is an, an expense we didn't see coming. So we're just trying, you know, we just live for the day in which we can finally burn that deed and not have to deal with that and expand maybe some other opportunities. But nevertheless, this is something that we just didn't see coming. We want to get it taken care of, and we believe we've done it to where anyone can give $15 and help out. Uh, even the smallest amount would do a lot. Hey, listen, uh, the next slide, uh, just a couple things. Uh, first of all, last two weeks we've been announcing that the local board of administration. We have. We want to bring forth a resolution and ask all the members to vote on this because we don't want to do this ourselves. But because of the guttering, uh, it's a big project, and because of the committees, I've been so proud of the reports I'm getting back from the committees that are just forming. There's a lot of responsibilities with the local board of administration right now, and normally we have new elections every year. Some hold over because of their office, trustees, and so forth. But um, we decided to put it before the congregation so that nobody would be elected brand new and then all of a sudden be thrust into the responsibilities of fundraising and, and organizing committees and being committee liaisons and so forth. That we wanted to put before the entire congregation the uh, possibility, the recommendation, I should say, that we keep the board as is through the next church year and then have open elections next spring instead of this spring. So what I would like to do is I would like to open that up and see if there's any discussion that anyone has a question about before we actually vote on this resolution. If no one has a question then, I want to bring that resolution forth, but I would like for someone to make the motion that it be voted on from the floor that is a member of the church. Motion is made by Fred Blackwood. I'm sorry? Second? Okay, Juliana shows second. All in favor that we keep the board as is for another full church year, would you respond by saying aye? aye. If there's any opposed, say no. 
thank you very much we'll look to say that the resolution passes thank you denise these are your local board members and their offices i thank them so much for all the incredible work that they do uh, it does not list uh, alec thompson as the assistant superintendent she of course will remain and those who are on the nominating committee uh, you may not even remember if you were elected on the nominating committee, but you will just hang, stay over another year. You will nominate names next spring whenever elections approach. So thank you so much for coordinating that effort. I do have one more announcement, and that is Joy uh, Burleson contacted me on Friday and asked if we could. I think that uh, the men's conference went so well, the women want to have a luncheon April the 29th. That is a Saturday, April the 29th. Joy is trying to get a steering committee together for that, uh, making arrangements for a ladies' luncheon on the 29th, and she would like to meet with anyone interested in being a part of her steering committee today at 5 o'clock here at the Family Life Center. Again, that's uh, Joy Burleson at 5 o'clock this afternoon at the Family Life Center. Okay, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but uh, we did have the men's conference. And the men's conference was a tremendous success. Just to give you some idea, last year, 11 men went up the mountains to Virginia to be a part at Liberty University of this same men's conference. And over the two days, Friday and Saturday, there were 26 men this year that came to support it. 26 different men. We had 20 each day, but three had to. Three couldn't come both days. Three couldn't. And I mean, six couldn't come both days. And when you think about that. Uh, these are six people that could not have attended because some of them could come Friday, but they couldn't come Saturday. Some could come Saturday, but they couldn't come Friday. This way, they all got to come, and it was wonderful. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Mark and Levi for the fish, and I know Troy helped out with that. Troy got us breakfast on uh, Saturday morning, and I want to thank Daryl and, and Chris and the guys at Pizza Stop for furnishing lunch for the guys yesterday. What a wonderful session it was. And I would like to invite, at this time, the men who were a part of this, to, if they'd like to come forward, they're welcome to. I'll tell you what, before you come forward, I'd like to just have them all stand, just to show you how serious the church is, the men in our church are, of becoming men of God. Let's tell them what, how much we are grateful for them. <laughs> Some are in the sound booth, too. Uh, I would invite any who would like to share this week. You don't have to share this week. We'll let you share another week. But any of you who would like to share this week, I'd like you to come very quickly to the platform and just, just share a little bit. Don't everybody grab your seat and, and sit back down. I know there's a few of you that would like to share. I'd like for you to come up for just a moment and say a little bit about what you learned this week as far as how you hope that it shapes you to be a better man of God. The rest of you can come behind Mr. Blackwell or somehow. Uh, well... I've thoroughly enjoyed the speakers that were uh, with each session. You know, I thought maybe it's going to be a dragged out thing, you know, all this, all this. Because the first one I went to, it seemed like forever getting there because it was in Greensboro. And Mark was telling Mark Harrison how to get there. <laughs> and, you know, that was, a, that was a big thing. But this was uh, something totally different. Each speaker, to me, somebody before him or somebody that was when he was young, he looked up to, and he, he followed in his pathway. Took him, took him under his wings and showed him that what needed to be done. And every, every speaker mentioned, as men of God, what needs to be done. So that, that really hit home. I know when I was young, I had somebody that I looked up to. It was my football coaches at Mount Pleasant because it seemed like from 7th, 8th grade to high school, I had the same coaches. Learned a lot of respect on yes, sir, and no, sir. So that meant a lot to me. Thank you so much, Fred. Appreciate that. Are there other gentlemen who'd like to come back, come forward? Now, I, if you're not coming, you're going to come later. I'm going to drag you back up here. Anybody else this week? Uh, again, so grateful, and it was uh, so meaningful. What Fred said is exactly right. There, we, as men of God, have to be leaders and influencers uh, with those that we come into contact with. Thank you so much, Fred, for that. All right. Uh, let's share some in the Word of God. Amen? You ready? All right. Let's look together 
in God's Word. I want to talk to you today about uh, something I call a precision Passover, a precision Passover. People give me a hard time. As a matter of fact, uh, they pick on me a little bit because this is the time of year specifically that I really focus on a lot that has to do with Judaism. And it seems odd because there is, you know, the Jewish, traditional Jewish teaching teaches that Jesus was not the promised Messiah. But uh, there's so much about the Jewish faith that is so beautiful and is so precise when it comes to this time of year that in a way I think that Christianity somehow misses and I, I want to get into that by opening with a question to you. Is Jesus everything or is Jesus part of a bigger picture? And I want you to think for just a second because as Christians we're raised and we sing songs like about Jesus and the name of Jesus and, and how uh, Jesus is all the world to me is one song that we sing. And some of us have, you know, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I don't in any way want to dispute that. It is all true. But Jesus in himself, no matter the accolades we bestow upon him as the Lamb of God, the uh, intercessor, the raised and soon coming king, all of that is true. Nevertheless, Jesus is part of the plan of salvation that was put into existence at the moment, if not before the moment, when mankind fell. I like the fact that there is a way to look at Jesus at this time of year as much more than just a casual uh, lesson that we teach on a particular Sunday that refers to Easter. You'll notice that I don't use the word Easter very often when I talk about the resurrection. I prefer to use Resurrection Sunday because of the fact that the, the word Easter itself comes from, uh, it's almost the exact spelling of a Babylonian pagan god called Esther. So, you'll notice that there's a lot about Judaism that comes into play. And that's one reason that we use the Passover meal to try to get a bigger picture and understanding of what this time is all about. Yes, Jesus is King. Yes, He is Messiah. Yes, He is the suffering Savior. All of that is true. But He is also the Lamb of God. Sometimes I think we think of the Lamb of God as being a gentle, descriptive of who Jesus is. But it's much more than that. It is the sacrifice which provides the blood that enables us to be cleansed of sin and to inherit eternal life. It was foretold not only in Scripture, but in the activity of Israel, the nation itself, when it was in bondage to Egypt. And that's what I really want to talk to you about today. A precision Passover. That's one reason I think it's so important that as many of us who are able will come to our Passover meal So, because we kind of get into emphasizing what took place and what continues to take place in the Jewish nation and how it now can be reconciled with Christianity because Messiah, the Lamb of God, has come to deliver us from our sin. So I hope you'll keep that in mind, and I hope you'll make your reservation by next Sunday to be with us the following Wednesday for our Passover meal. Okay, let's begin like this. September 25th is a special day in my life. Do you know what it is? It's my birthday. September 25th is my birthday. Now, I want to tell you something about that. Uh, last year, I decided instead of September 25th, that uh, 30 days earlier on August the, twi the uh, 20, I wrote it down, August 27th was the day I celebrated last year. I just decided that I wanted to celebrate it last year. Now this year I'm going to celebrate it on September 23rd. Because I've decided that my birthday should always be on a Saturday. You wouldn't do that, would you? Why wouldn't you do that? Because it takes away the uniqueness of that special day, doesn't it? Certainly it does. 
Yeah. My anniversary is November the 7th, 1992. See? Still got it. But we decided instead, uh, we, we think that our anniversary should be celebrated on Friday. So every year what we do is we pick a Friday close to around that same day and we celebrate our anniversary on that day. That's not true at all. Okay, Just as it wouldn't be true to you. Why? Because the special nature of the day that stands out is no longer there. If you keep moving it around, you fail, right? To ign- I mean, it's not a spe- you know, people call you on the phone, isn't this your birthday? No, this isn't your birthday. Well, this is a day you celebrated it last year, right? It just doesn't make sense. We always keep it the same day for every year. It, or Otherwise, it doesn't stand out if you keep moving it all around. I want to introduce you to a guy named Pope Gregory the 13th. And in October of 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th introduced what we know today as the Western calendar. He was so arrogant, he called it the Gregorian calendar. I don't know how arrogant he was. It was just named after him. I don't know anything about Pope Gregory, except that he's the one that invented the Western calendar that we use today. Now, one reason was because the Catholic Church felt very strongly that the day they set aside to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus should coincide with the equinox, the spring equinox, if you will. And so they decided that uh, the early church celebrated it during the spring. Or the, you know, they, they wanted the early church. They looked at the scriptures, saw what the early church did, and they decided that it must have been celebrated near the spring equinox. They redesigned the calendar, and they made sure that they would put Easter on a Sunday, and they introduced the Gregorian calendar. Like I said, next week now, though, comes the celebration of Passover, and the festival of unleavened bread. That's what the Jews practice, and I think I want to just take a moment and talk for a a second about it. These two celebrations were instituted by Moses through God's instruction, and most Jews today still practice it. Not just Jews who don't believe that Jesus was Messiah, but Messianic Jews also still celebrate the Passover, and they still celebrate uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yet the Christian church pretty much discounts them. Most of us grew up in church and we never ever celebrated Passover like the Jews did. Because we thought since Jesus came, that eliminated the need for Passover. And we've been taught and raised in Western culture, Western civilization, and we neglected to celebrate these because we, in a sense, almost thought that the Jews were responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. They didn't believe He was Messiah. And therefore, we discounted this annual ritual of Passover, although God Himself told Moses that they were to keep this every year during the first month. Now, the trick is, since we got away from the lunar month that the Jews followed, and we introduced the Gregorian calendar uh, by Pope Gregory in the 1500s, almost the 1600s, then obviously there was a little bit of a problem there. The Catholic Church, based upon what they knew and what they wanted to establish, decided, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll introduce the, the theme of Good Friday... And we'll put it in the spring, and we'll say that's the day that Jesus died. And we'll also make it a Sunday every year where we will celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and we'll call it Easter. And they move it. You know how it is. It's always kind of a joke in, in uh, pastoral circles when we get a calendar and say, Hey, look, Easter's on a Sunday again this year. Easter's always on a Sunday. And I hate to break it to you, none of us know the date when Jesus died or was resurrected. None of us know the date. We know the day was the first day of the week. We know he was, he was raised after three days. But that's all we know. And the one reason that's all we know and we don't know the date is because the calendar we use today wasn't created until it was almost 1600. So we can't reconcile these dates. We don't know. Now, the reason that troubles me is because there's not a lot of Christian holidays anymore. We have Christmas, but we don't move Christmas around, 
it falls on Saturday, if it falls on Tuesday, it falls on Wednesday, we don't change it. It's always the same day, 25th of December. This is the only day that we do that with. It's the only day that we move around to where it's always on Sunday. The resurrection always is celebrated on a Sunday in the Christian church. And we have Good Friday the Friday before. Now you say, well, Pastor Mark, we do that with Thanksgiving. Totally different. That's an American holiday. Thanksgiving, we do it on Thursday. I know that. We're talking about the basic Christian belief in the resurrection. We apply these rules of fluctuation to this particular day, which is troubling to me. We make sure it falls on Sunday because of the Gregorian calendar. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Don't think that Pastor Mark is, is heretical or, or what's he talking about. But I think here's the problem. You remember how I said I don't celebrate my birthday on a different day every year because I want it on a Saturday? And I don't celebrate my anniversary on the same day every year because I want it on a Friday or whatever the situation is. I said we don't do that because that loses something when it comes to the special nature of that particular day. So my theory is that we've done an injustice to the resurrection by moving it around. Because, in a sense, what ended up happening, sadly, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, is that Easter became a time in which spring break got introduced and became a holiday and lost all semblance of a holy day. It became a day which varied and I think there's something about the Western mind that can't focus on the resurrection the way it should. And we lost our ability to testify to the glory of the resurrection because we're passing it around on the calendar. Let me, let me show you what I mean. This is why I believe in the specificity, specificity of the Passover as being so important to God and why I think the resurrection almost unfortunately doesn't receive what it should receive because we have lost something in the translation of the Western calendar. You say, Pastor Mark, man, this is some deep stuff. Not really. Just stay with me for a minute. I want to speak on the Passover and its precise date. Now, most of us can recall... If we know our Old Testament, the Passover ritual given to the Israelites when they were being held captive in Egypt in Exodus 12. God talks to Moses. He sets their calendar. And he tells them that the month they leave Egypt will be known as the first month forever. The month you leave will be known as the first month. They're told then to choose a lamb on the 10th day of that month. And they are told on the 14th day to put it to death, to kill it. And the month, by the way, is called, a Nissan, or it's called Nissan. I don't think it has anything to do with the car we drive. But it's called Nissan. It may have something to do with it because it's the first, the first one. I don't know, but anyhow. All right. Then in verse 7 of chapter 12, they're told to put the blood on the top and the sides of the doorpost of the lamb that they kill. We know that story. You remember that story? You heard it in Sunday school. Take the blood, apply it to the doorposts. Because, verse 12 tells us in this same chapter, that God is going to pass through Egypt and he's going to kill every firstborn, but will pass over the houses where the blood is displayed. He will not take the life of the firstborn, where he sees the blood on the doorpost of the house. The Bible tells us that all that was carried out in verse 29 and 30 of that chapter. God came through the, the streets there in Egypt and took the life of the firstborn. Now, stay with me. The Israelites were freed on that Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the Jewish calendar. The 14th. I want you to look with me at chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. 
It says, about midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Now, I want you to remember that woman at the hand mill. Just kind of tuck that away for just a second because I'm going to come back to her later. Now, let's look at Exodus 13, verse 2. God is talking to Moses. He says, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. So what's he saying? He's saying the Israelites are literally to redeem their firstborn by bringing a sacrifice for it. We know that Mary did that whenever Jesus was born. It, it was a tradition. They would bring a sacrifice and they would redeem not only the children but the firstborn of the cattle. And it was a tradition that was to be upheld in the Jewish nation. So then verse 3, it says, Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Commemorate what day? This day, the 14th of Nisan. Verse 10 says, they are to keep the ordinance at the appointed time year after year. Do I have that in verse 10, Andy, on the next slide? Do I have that? Yeah, look at that. They are to keep the ordinance at the appointed time year after year. Now, he goes on to talk about how they're going to celebrate this and how they're going to celebrate it. They're going to continue to choose the lamb. They're going to continue to slaughter the lamb on the 14th. They're going to continue to, to share the meal together on the 14th of Nisan year after year after year. Now, I want you to look at what it says in verse 14. In days to come, when your son asks you, what son? The son you've already redeemed. The son that you gave a sacrifice for whenever you redeemed him back. When your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, do it every year. Remind them every year. What does the Bible tell us? Whenever we lie down, we're to meditate on his laws and his decrees. And whenever we get up, we're supposed to also. We're supposed to share it as we walk along the road. And he says, at least once a year, commemorate this by doing what I tell you to do and remind your children when they say, why do we do this, Dad? Why do we do this, Mom? Tell them this was the day that God brought us out of slavery. Simple. Now stay with me. Probably like most of you, I became a Christian because of the testimony of my father. I've probably shared with some of you, many of you, that my mother and father were going through a very rough road. I was about eight or nine at the time, and my dad came to me. He was against the wall uh, financially. He was struggling spiritually, although raised in a Christian home. And he decided one night before a television, listening to Billy Graham in the basement of my grandfather's house, not his dad, my, his father-in-law's house, he got on his knees and he said, Lord, if you will just help me in my situation, I'll do my best to live for you. He came upstairs and the next day, I remember my father went to work, nothing special about that, but he came home that afternoon and then me and him were sitting alone in the den and he said, son, I want to tell you something. He said, last night I decided to give my heart to the Lord. I bet that was hard for my dad to do. I'd always kind of looked up to my dad. He came from a family of pastors and so on. I always kind of felt like dad was okay. You know, a lot of us sons, we think dad's okay. You know, he's all right with God, most of us. And he told me, he said, I've decided that uh, I'm going to live for him. You know what I did? Within half an hour, I went to my own bedroom and I asked Jesus into my heart. Now, that's not to say that from the age of nine until the age of 54 that I always followed the Lord. But I am saying that it made an incredible impression upon a young man's mind that there was something greater than my father who in my eyes was the biggest man I ever knew 
Some of you who are at the conference know my dad's only about 5'8", but to me, he was still the biggest man I ever knew. And to this day, I still think a great deal of my father's opinion. I still cherish the times when we can talk intimately about the faith. And I see the faith in much the same way that he does. Many of you, I'm sure, found the Lord in the same way. Dad shared something with you. Mom shared something with you. Gave a testimony. And told them, or told you rather, how they felt delivered. They felt as though God had entered their life, we used to say came into their heart and delivered them from the bondage that sin had them bound in. Some people, when I was growing up, could even tell you the exact day that they gave their heart to Jesus. You ever known people like that? Say, I'll never forget it, preacher. September 25th, 1944. I used to always feel like I was lousy because I couldn't remember the day. But some people could even do that. But I want you to look with me at verse 8 for just a second. Whenever your son asks you, on that day, tell your son, I do this. I do what? I practice the Passover because of what the Lord did for me when I came up out of Egypt. When I came out of Egypt. When I came out of bondage. Why did my dad want to tell me about his giving his heart to Jesus? Because Jesus had taken him out of the bondage of sin and death. And so, you know, when I grow up, I'm supposed to do the same thing to my children. I'm supposed to say, hey, listen, I gave my heart to Jesus. Why? Because he is able to deliver me from the bondage of sin and death. And I need to remind you of that occasionally, that I gave my heart to Jesus and there was a day in which he made all the difference to me. And I want to share it with you so that one day you will grow up and you will tell your child, hey, I gave my life to Jesus who delivered me and brought me up out of the Egypt of my sin and death. He brought me deliverance. Now let's, let's be truthful. Let's get down to the nitty gritty, as Gladys might, Knight might say in her song. Let's get right down to the real nitty-gritty. That's what she would say. Some of you don't even know who Gladys Knight is, do you? Um, testimonies are gone in the church. Would you agree with me? Isn't that terrible? Testimonies are gone in the church. We no longer hear people just stand up because they're overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit and they want to share their faith. They're gone. You ever think one reason may be because we don't celebrate our great freedom from bondage on the same day year after year like the Jews were told to? We each have an individual Passover day when we took the blood of Jesus and applied it to our heart. Each of us, if we are truthful and we really gave our heart to Jesus, we really meant it, we took his blood and we put it on our heart, the, the posts of our heart. And the day we did that, the death, the eternal damnation, we don't have to fear it anymore because God's angel of death will pass over us. We will inherit eternal life. Are you with me? You understand that? That concept, you got it? Now, we did that as individuals, but... As a matter of fact, I mean, I mean, I love it because the Bible tells us it was the He is the Lamb of God. That's exactly what John the Baptist described Jesus as. Behold, the Lamb of God, he said to his disciples, that takes away the sins of the world. So that Lamb of God, that same blood, we applied it to our hearts to wash away our sin, and therefore we are to be passed over. If we're a Christian and we were delivered from sin, do we have trouble recalling it? Because, in a sense, we've, we've lost the ability, the specifics. See, I think what happens too often is we are hyper-grace Christians. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the fact that Jesus arose from the dead and all of that. And now we can dismiss the future. Our salvation is secure. And so, sadly, 
we never bother to pass it down to the sons anymore. Our sons and daughters are being lost in droves. I, I, I listen to my, my own daughter tell me what she has to endure teaching at school. I know what my other daughter endured just going to school. And I hope that somewhere, somehow, they got enough of what God did for me, delivering me from sin, so it made an impression on their lives. But I have to confess to you and be transparent to, to one who's here today and to the rest of you that I probably did not testify enough. Because, see... There's something about the annual ritual that brings things back around. You know, Carrie's birthday's coming up April 3rd. And I, I dare say that if I don't remember Carrie's birthday coming up on April 3rd, I, I may get a little cold shoulder on April 4th. Would I get a little cold shoulder on April 4th? And see, what I'm convinced has happened is that with the misplacement of the resurrection on our calendar, we have lost the ability to be reminded you know, Christmas we don't ever worry about, do we? Because, man, we're all set for Christmas when it gets here. We're all ready for Christmas. We've got our shopping done. We've got everything baked, ready to go. We've got all the gifts bought, everything, the trees up, all that. But see, listen to me very carefully. We have this great day when we, we, we recall the resurrection that is to be celebrated communally, uh, together as a family of believers, as a congregation. But sadly, as I mentioned before, it has become part of nothing more than spring break and beach trips, and it's lost its ability to stand the test of time because I believe the church made a grave mistake years ago. We stopped the continuity of God's annual ritual and festival of Passover. And Passover showed us the deliverance and let me tell you something that Passover also does, which many Christians don't know because we've cast it aside. Passover also points to the Messiah that is to come. And it's so clear and it's so obvious when you sit there and you celebrate the Passover. You take of elements and then you read in the scriptures of how Jesus had them to sit down and he took the wine and he took the, the bread. And, and we look at the bread itself. I've got a picture of it right there. And you see how it's striped. It's also pierced. We take three pieces and we break the, or we, we put them in what is called a, a, a matzotash. And we take the middle one. You can ask rabbis, why do we take the second one? They don't even know. Because they're not messianic. We take it, we break it. As his body was broken, we wrap half of it in a linen cloth and we hide it. The Jews still do not see this. The Orthodox Jews do not understand but those who are messianic, those who know Christ came, we understand the wrapping of the body. We hide it and the children later in the, in the ceremony go and they find it and they bring it back. Why? Because it is brought forth from the grave, from the darkness that it was buried in. It's so clear. It's all in the Passover. When Jesus took the wine and, and he gave it to them, he said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out. He said, take and eat. This is my body. The striped, pierced body, broken for you. We institute communion now. We call it communion. We have, you know, we have the Lord's Supper. It was just part of Passover way back when. And Jesus is giving them a great revelation. He's saying, you know, you've been doing this for generations. Well, now let me show you what it really is. It's me. It's me. I'm who led the children of Israel out in the cloud. I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He says, it's all about me. And now, us in the Christian church, the same one that delivered Israel from Egypt delivers us from bondage. From the bondage of sin and death and decay. He is resurrected, brought forth. He is unwrapped. He is glorified. He is King of kings. And He's coming again. 
And that's why we have to constantly repeat the deliverance He offered us to the next generation. But we fail to do it. Why? Because our anniversary falls on a different day every year. He said, well, Mark, that really doesn't have to do with anything for me from a personal standpoint. Good, I'm glad you feel that way. Start sharing with your child what Jesus did for you today. Start sharing with the next generation today. Mark it on the calendar. Say, you know what? Today, and at the end of March, I wrote down. You know, just say, I, I, this is the day I shared. And every year, I want to remember that. I want to come back to it. Hey, let, here's something really daring. Do it more than once a year. We do have the Lord's Supper more than once a year. Share your testimony with your children more than once a year. Share it with your son. And when they say, why do you do this, Dad? Say, it's because God delivered me from the sin and the death. Just as the Jews said, he delivered us from Israel, from Egypt and the bondage we face there. This and I'm done. Remember the woman that I told you to remember? The woman that was grinding at the hand mill? I want you to look at what Jesus himself says in Matthew 24. This is years later, thousands, you know, hundreds, thousands of years later. I was going to say thousands. Is it thousands? I guess it's thousands of years later. Jesus says this. Matthew 24, verse 39 through 42. He's talking about his return when he comes the second time. I want you to look at what he says. Verse 39. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. And then look at who he points out again that his father pointed out. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Listen to me. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. There's that lady again, the woman with the hand mill. The one that he was just talking about way back in Exodus. He's talking about it again here in Matthew. Here's what I think is missing. God passed over his people in a very precise way. He looked for the blood. And if he didn't see the blood, he took the firstborn. But the way to find salvation from the death that was in the air was to apply the blood. And listen to me, church. That was the only way. The only way. So this year, before we come together, and next week we'll celebrate Palm Sunday, and the week after that we'll celebrate the glorious resurrection. And, and I'm not in any way discounting all of that. It is wonderful, glorious, monumental. Understand, Pastor Mark don't make the rules, and you don't either. And I want you to think about how you feel about the specific judgment of God. How he knows that which is in your life, which you think he doesn't know. i got to tell you something, I was a firstborn son. You better believe I would have been asking my dad, is the blood still there, daddy? Is the blood still there, daddy? I want to ask every one of you, dad, mom, son, daughter, is the blood still there? Because just as he took the firstborn from Pharaoh's palace, he took the firstborn of the slave. And you can hide and lie to yourself and say, oh, it'll be okay because the resurrection, Jesus is all love and all merciful and he's this tender lamb. No, he's the lamb, all right. He's got the blood you've got to apply to your heart because I'll promise you judgment will be specific. And if he comes tonight, will he find blood on your heart? Would you stand with me?
We're going to close, of course. I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me. And I know this sermon was kind of different because I talked about some things I think the church has missed. But I want all that aside, I just want to ask you that question again. Are you sure the blood's on your heart? Is it still there? Was it there one time, but you know that, uh, you know, the sandstorms come, blow it away. You know yourself if you're following Christ. I don't mean just believing in who he is. I mean if you're his follower, if, you're deci- if you are his disciple, you know. And you also know if there are things in your life that shouldn't be there. And let me assure you that if you know, Pastor Mark don't need to know, but I know someone who does know. And you're not going to get away with it. You need the cleansing of the blood. As we close the service, is there someone here today that says, Pastor Mark, it's true, I'm ashamed. I have not shared with my child what God's delivered me from. But, you know, honestly, no one shared it with me. Now I understand. I want to be delivered. Is there someone bold enough today to say yes to Jesus that might start a great sense of repentance in our church don't do it for that reason but just do it so that the blood can be applied so you don't need to worry and make a promise to share it with those who need to know it the altar's open if you need to come and make a confession if you need to come and invite Jesus into your heart if you need to come and just recommit your life to him will you do it right now just in the silence of the moment. Would you come to the altar? You say, Pastor Mark, I can't kneel. That's okay. You can sit here. It's okay. You can stand at the altar. It doesn't matter. But if, if I'm speaking to you right now and you know it, if the Spirit's troubling you right now, would you come forward right this minute? Don't make me wait and call. And, and you know, just, just very subtly. I think the Spirit's already gone before me. You know who you are. If you need to make the confession, do it now. Everyone praying, oh, if there's someone here today, Lord, that needs you, help them to make a public pronouncement of it. Help them to come forward right now. I'm not going to hold you but a minute. Someone there? Just another second. Oh, Father, hear us today. Work in us today. Work in our lives today. Change us today. Father, I thank you so much for this group that's come out to hear your word today. I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord, for their willingness to look into the word of God and their openness to try to understand and grow in it. I thank you for what you're doing in our church, and I believe that great days are ahead. I believe Satan doesn't want any part of it. And he will do everything he can to stop us from confessing our sin, repenting and coming forward to give you every bit of our life of giving you first place. And so, Lord, I just beckon your Holy Spirit to come upon us in such a powerful way. Forgive us where we fail, Lord, to help us to stand up to the criticism of the day and those who would have us to keep our mouths silent and help us to testify to those in the next generation and everyone we come into contact with that you are the great deliverer. You are desperately wanted and needed, and you are the only way that we can breathe and see another day. Be close to us in this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Hope you'll join me tonight on Facebook for prayer time. Just so you know, those who are trying to follow us on YouTube, we're having problems, Facebook and YouTube not getting along. So just about everything that's uploaded right now will be